Well, good morning, everyone. We're just about to start our service, so if you would like to find your seats. Good morning, and welcome to our Sylvania Anglican Church 8 a.m. service. My name is Adam Johnson. I'm the student minister here at Sylvania Anglican Church, and it's a pleasure to be here with you this morning as we gather together as God's people, as brothers and sisters, to hear how God speak to us, to hear hymns sung to his praise to uh, and to pray to him together as well and this morning we're continuing our series in the prophet Jonah and we're up to Jonah chapter 3 where we see God's mighty power on display but not in magnificent signs of, of uh, judgment or flashy lights or anything like that but instead in changed hearts as his warning is heard and lives are changed. So, to begin with, we're going to be reminded in a hymn that actually our lives have been changed by the Lord our God as well. That he has changed us. He's brought us from death to life in the death and resurrection of his son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And that now we are his children, but we are also his servants. So let's listen to this first hymn as it is sung for us, uh, You Servants of God. And let's remind ourselves of how our God has won us for himself.
brothers and sisters, hear these words from Psalm 51, verse 17, as we together begin our time uh, praying to our God. So from Psalm 51, verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. See, although we are the people of God, the scriptures remind us that we still sin. Therefore, we need to confess our failures, knowing that the Lord Jesus died for us and intercedes for us with the Father. So let us draw near to God, who freely forgives through his infinite goodness and mercy. And let us pray to him with sincerity and confidence in the words of this confession as it appears on the screen. Together? Heavenly Father, we praise you for adopting us as your children and making us heirs of eternal life. In your mercy, you have washed us from our sins and made us clean in your sight. Yet we still fail to love you and serve you as we should. Forgive us our sins and renew us by your grace that we may continue to grow as members of Christ in whom alone is our salvation. Amen. Brothers and sisters, hear these words of assurance because God is slow to anger and full of compassion. He forgives all who humbly repent and turn to his son, Jesus Christ, in whom there is no condemnation. Amen. Now, would you please uh, continue to join with me in prayer? I'll be leading us in prayer for uh, David and the Fell family on Norfolk Island and for our uh, neighbouring suburb of Kangaroo Point. And then I'll be inviting us to join in together again with uh, the Lord's Prayer, our family prayer, as the Lord Jesus taught us to pray. So would you please pray with me as I lead us in prayer for David Fell and his family on Norfolk Island. Kind Father, we praise you and thank you for David and the Fell family on Norfolk Island and the joy we have of sharing in the work of the gospel with them throughout 2021. Please help us to be an encouragement and a joy to them as they go about this work. Thank you for the work of the Fell family and what they are doing on Norfolk Island. Thank you for David's work as a chaplain and the many ways that he can spread your word there and that he can encourage our brothers and sisters on Norfolk Island and bear witness in that community. Please continue to strengthen and uphold him and his family as they go about this work. Kind Father, thank you for the creativity you have given the Fell family in this area as well. We ask that through their efforts that you would grow your kingdom, have mercy on more people. Please hear us, Father, not for our sake, but for the sake of Christ our Lord. Amen. And now for our neighbouring suburb, Kangaroo Point. <coughs> Merciful and kind Father, we thank you for the small suburb of Kangaroo Point near us and the 560 or so people who live there. We thank you that you love these people and have loved them in the life, death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Please help us, Father, to be faithful and effective witnesses to the people of Kangaroo Point. Please give us wisdom and understanding in how we can best reach them and spread your word to them. And so, with your word, help to grow your kingdom. Father, please have mercy on the lost that are in Kangaroo Point. Please help them to see their need for the Lord Jesus and not the things of this world. Strengthen any of our brothers and sisters who live in that suburb. Thank you, Father, that you have given us the wonderful task of witnessing to them. Please help us to love the people who live there with the love that you have for them. Please hear us for the name of Jesus our Lord. Amen. Now would you join with me together as the Lord Jesus taught us to pray with the words of the Lord's Prayer as it appears on the screen. Together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, it's time for some church family news, and Mark is going to uh, 
tell us about what's been going on. It's a pleasure to have him back from holidays. So, Mark, if you would like to tell us what's going on, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Adam, and good to see you all. Lovely to see you all. We do miss uh, being amongst the Fellowship of Believers here, uh, even when we're on holidays. Uh, but it was great to meet with other brothers and sisters in Christ in other locations over the last couple of Sundays and to encourage them as they've had to navigate similar uh, circumstances, of course, over the last 12 months. And so it was great to visit the saints at Ingadine Anglican Church and at my church where I grew up at Yaguna Anglican Church um, over the last two Sundays and to uh, encourage them and to be encouraged by them. But uh, you were in very good hands over the last couple of Sundays as uh, Andy and the team continue to navigate uh, yet another change in regards to our meeting together and that's uh, the Service New South Wales app uh, as we have become acquainted with uh, in recent times. Friends, um, uh, thank you also uh, for your ongoing financial partnership with us and uh, we continue as we move into this year, we commence a new financial uh, partnership year and uh, please continue to give uh, financially online and uh, our details are there on the screen and thank you for uh, one of the encouragements from last year is that uh, people have been, the 55% were giving online pre-COVID and about 97% <laughs> are now giving online. Uh, and so that uh, is a great help in all sorts of ways, not least uh, we don't have to count money uh, on a Sunday morning, uh, which saves an enormous amount of effort and administration. So um, uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, brothers and sisters, uh, just um, one other announcement this morning by way of a short story. Uh, many of you know our, uh, our late dear sister in Christ, Shirley Hunt, who a long-term member of our church here. Um, Shirley went to be with the Lord uh, in the middle of, well, uh, early to mid last year, and uh, I conducted her funeral. Her funeral was, in fact, the last funeral that was conducted in this building uh, before lockdown, the COVID lo lockdown last year. Well, uh, as you know, Shirley uh, suffered from ill health for many, many years. And uh, on one occasion, I gave her this book uh, called uh, Sickness, by a man called John Ryle, uh, Bishop J.C. Ryle. And uh, I gave Shirley this book and um, I went to visit her in hospital because uh, she was in hospital again. I can't remember which hospital it was now. But I said to Shirley, did you read the book? And she said, yes, I did. And I replied, and what did you think of it? And she said, it was very good, but there was just one problem. And I said, uh, what was that, Shirley? And uh, she said, you should have given it to me before I got sick. <laughs> and you know what? She was absolutely right. Absolutely right. And those words, that conversation that took place seven or eight years ago now, uh, has always remained with me. And that's why we need to be ready for sickness while we're healthy. Uh, if we're uh, sick, then, uh, of course we're sick already but if we're not sick then we need to know that one day we will be and um, this book by J.C. Ryle is the best book that I've read on the subject of a Christian approach to sickness and because I feel so strongly about this small book it's a very thin book uh, but it says everything that I would want to say to you as your pastor about sickness. Uh, J.C. Ryle talks about sickness in this way, he says, I know the suffering and pain which sickness involves. I admit the misery and wretchedness which it often brings, but I cannot regard it as completely evil. In fact, J.C. Rowell goes on to explain that sickness can be a rich blessing from God, a rich gift from God. And that's counterintuitive, isn't it? Now, it's very important that you read this message. And so out of my own financial reserves, uh, I am uh, purchasing sufficient copies of this book for every household in our church congregations. So as you exit the building uh, this morning, one of our ushers will give you, uh, with their gloved hands, uh, a copy of J.C. Ryle's book, Sickness. Can I urge you, please, to read it? It only takes 15 to 20 minutes. Read it. 
pray about it, talk about it with your Christian brothers and sisters and be ready for that day when you will be sick and an opportunity to honour God. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Mark, and thank you for your generosity in purchasing a, a book for every household here as well. It's extraordinary. Brothers and sisters, uh, as a sort of continuation of announcement time, uh, what we're going to do now, uh, a little bit like last week, we're going to turn to one another as well and greet each other because we are uh, brothers and sisters in Christ here together and it's good for us as a church to actually experience the fellowship of church while we're here uh, together. So turn to one another, say hello, but also you might want to uh, encourage each other with how God has changed you, uh, changed you uh, maybe throughout your life or even during this week, how, how you've seen uh, God interact with you this week or how you've been praying to him together as well. Maybe pray to each, uh, with each other as well for a minute or two. Uh, and then afterwards, I'll call us back together for us to say a creed. Uh, and if you're watching online, you might like to take this opportunity to maybe write an email to us or pray quietly yourself or um, get up and stretch if you need to. But yeah, for now, for the next two or three minutes, let's say hello to each other, pray for each other and talk about how God has changed your life. seems a shame brothers and sisters to ask these conversations to be uh, drawn to a quick conclusion but maybe if you're halfway through a sentence or halfway through uh, discussing something wonderful together you might like to continue that conversation later over a cup of tea at, uh, at home or at a cafe somewhere nearby but <laughs> 
that it's time for us to draw together again and with one voice to uh, declare what it is that we believe in the words of the Nicene Creed. This creed was uh, put together for us. It's a, it's a bit of a longer creed, but it was put together for us uh, by the church in the ancient days to, to guard us against uh, heresy, to guard us against un, uh, incorrect beliefs about God and also to reaffirm who our God is. So please, if you are able, stand and let's encourage one another with the truth of our God, with the words of the Nicene Creed. Together, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. He was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, universal and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. And I invite you now to get your Bibles out and open them to Jonah chapter 2. Uh, sorry, no, Jonah chapter 3. We did Jonah 2 last week. Uh, and that's because... God is about to address us as his word, the Bible, is read aloud and taught from. So again, that's Jonah 3, not 2, 3. Uh, Sonia is going to be reading that passage out for us. And after Sonia has read out uh, God's word, Andy will come up and teach us from that passage. Thank you, Sonia. Jonah chapter 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth, from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows, God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. This is the word of the Lord. No, 
nice to be able to remove this. You notice uh, how hard it is to speak with a mask on, don't you, when you're doing the, the creeds, constantly flicking it back on your nose because it pulls it down. Uh, friends, we are looking at Jonah 3, and uh, you might have been delighted to discover you got given a handout when you got here today. I trust you'll find that helpful. Uh, it's got the Bible passage on one side and space for notes on the other, so please use that. I'm going to pray as we look at God's word together. Father God, we praise you that you speak to us, that your word is powerful and effective, and we pray, Father, that you will do that changing work in us today as we uh, know you better as we read it. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, it is uh, a new year, and I wonder if you made any New Year's resolutions this time around, uh, other than don't get COVID or something like that. Uh, new Year's resolutions, did you make any? Uh, I find the whole concept quite a fan like a fascinating phenomena new year's resolutions uh, because every year people decide to make these radical changes in their life only to discover that changing the calendar actually does very little at changing behavior or practice or life or anything right uh, it was quite funny um, that i was with my sister and brother-in-law on january 1st and by the afternoon of january 1st my brother-in-law couldn't even remember what his New Year's resolution was. And I suspect that that's not an unusual experience for many. Uh, you see, we often, we want change. We know we need to change. We'll uh, turn to all sorts of things to help us with that change, whether it's uh, gyms and diets for health, uh, education, maybe we'll even get some professional assistance, counselling, that sort of thing. But I think the whole New Year's resolution phenomena shows us that real change is really hard. And often it feels beyond us, doesn't it, to, to really change. Uh, so is there something that actually works when it comes to change? Uh, for us and for others, very importantly. And especially when it comes to those most important things, something that can change our hearts, our minds, our future, is there something that actually works? Well, wonderfully, the answer is yes. And it's actually right under our noses. Uh, even though it may feel ho-hum, even though it may seem quite ordinary, God's word, right? God's word actually changes hearts and remakes lives. It really does. But I'm not sure that we always believe that. Do you? Do you believe that God's word actually changes lives? So God in his kindness shows us again and again that his word is powerful and effective so that we might learn to come to him in his word uh, for that transformation. See, that's actually what Jonah 3 is all about. The power of God's word to change lives. Uh, because he begins actually with Jonah himself. Uh, we see that God's word brings a fresh start. A fresh start. Listen to, to verse 1. It said, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. Now, you might have missed it, but there's actually some very wonderful words there in verse 1. Anyone guess what they are? They are a second time. A second time, right? Why are they such wonderful words? Because that means a fresh start for Jonah, right? The same prophet who ran away, he's forgiven. The same prophet who told God to get lost, he has been given a clean slate, a fresh start. Not because his guilt was small, actually quite the opposite. But because God's mercy is so big. And when God deals with your sin, it is truly dealt with, truly gone. Uh, of course, I think you'd agree one of the most enduring images from the book of Jonah itself is the big fish, right, swallowing this guy whole. Uh, it's, you know, led to all sorts of artworks and kids' storybooks. It's a captivating picture of these jaws kind of enclosing this man, completely enveloping him, engulfing him. Ironically, that's actually a helpful picture of God's mercy as well. Because God actually orchestrates for sin 
to be swallowed whole. For guilt to be completely enveloped. Uh, Even though it hadn't yet happened in history, uh, God would send Jesus, the Lamb of God, who, what does John say? Takes away the sin of the world. Not just distracts God from it or kind of throws a blanket over our sin. No, no, takes it away. The sin of Jonah. The sin of you. The sin of yesterday. The sin of tomorrow. Isn't that wonderful news? Everyone who admits guilt and throws themselves upon the mercy of God in Christ receives full and total forgiveness. That's the wonder of the gospel. Isn't it great? Which means a fresh start with God truly is a fresh start, isn't it? Do you believe that? See, I suspect for many of us, that's actually hard for us to grasp, that we are truly forgiven. I mean, personally, I don't handle failure particularly well, and I'm seeing that that's true of my kids because they are my kids, I suspect. Uh, I sometimes lie awake at night replaying mistakes, you know, my harsh words, my angry parental outbursts, even when the people that I've wronged have forgiven me. See, I I find it hard to move on. And so I suspect, well, God probably does too. He's probably looking at me going, ah, Andy, really, again? But he doesn't. He doesn't. Isn't that incredible? Incredible. A fresh start with God is a fresh start. Sin acknowledged is sin removed because Christ's death has swallowed our sin at the cross totally and completely. Jonah received a fresh start. That's the mercy of God. You can too. Because God's fresh start for Jonah then empowers him to embark on a difficult task. That's what we see in verses 3 and 4. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Jonah was exceedingly, sorry, Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So I don't think I have to tell you, Jonah's task was pretty daunting, wasn't it? I mean, first of all, it's a big job. This is a big city and Jonah has to go to the whole city proclaiming this message. Now, how did he do it? We're not told. Was he like the crazy sandwich board guy ringing a bell? Maybe. Was, he, was it the greatest door knocking campaign that's ever been embarked on? Again, we don't know. But it's likely this city was a, about 120,000 people, something like that. This is a big job. But of course, more than that, it's a hard job, isn't it? I mean, Jonah's message was 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Now, that's probably a summary, uh, but it doesn't make it any easier, does it? You know, no matter what jokes he told, no matter if he shared some of his own testimony as he sought to bring this news, No, his message was, hey, Nineveh, stop your wicked ways right now or God will destroy you. That's that's the message. I mean, how would you react to hearing that? How would you feel declaring that, being the sandwich board guy ringing the bell? Well, I don't know how you'd feel, but Jonah's experience reminds us of a couple of really helpful things. And the first is that, well, actually, obedience to God is hard. Obedience to God is hard. Uh, Sometimes we fool ourselves into thinking that the Christian life should be easy. You know, God is glorious. He's given us this wonderful privilege of being part of his uh, work in the world. It should be exciting and wonderful and energizing, and it is, often. But if that's all we expect, then we've forgotten our context haven't we? I mean, gospel mission means engaging a rebellious world with an unpopular message. It's what we have to do, whilst at the same time we're battling our own sinful nature and a spiritual uh, resistance that is real that happens as well. See, faithful gospel ministry is hard, 
But the good news is that means it's okay to find it hard, right? Whether it's witnessing at work, whether it's serving in kids' ministry, whether it's opening the Bible with your own children or grandchildren, uh, whether it's persisting in an awkward Bible study group, right? Obeying God will sometimes be tedious and tiring and difficult. But that doesn't mean something's gone wrong or you're doing it wrong. Obedience to God is hard often, and that's okay. But the second thing Jonah shows us is the message of mercy requires the news of judgment, doesn't it? The message of mercy requires the news of judgment. See, remember, Jonah's message was 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Why was that necessary to say, though? Well, it's because without the warning, Nineveh will not repent, will it? Uh, when we go out as a family, typically I drive, um, and sometimes, without realising, I find myself drifting into autopilot. I think you probably know what I mean. I'm just driving somewhere. <laughs> I'm driving, we're safe, we're not going to crash, but I'm just driving, right? Uh, that is until my navigator, Nicole, interjects. Where are you going? We need to turn left back there, turn the car around. See, left to myself, I would happily head down the wrong track, quite oblivious, uh, probably singing, let's be honest. But with my error exposed, and only then do I turn the car around to take us where we need to go, where we should be. Brothers and sisters, gospel mission requires that honesty. You're going the wrong way. Turn around. Turn back. Now, of course, we don't delight as Christians in judgment. Neither does God. You need to know that. Uh, neither do we condemn others as somehow different to us, that we're above them somehow. No, no, no. That's not us. But at some point... People must hear of God's righteous anger at sin and his certain judgment to come if they are to seek forgiveness in Christ. They must know that. Do you know what? I find it scary. I find it scary. I often shirk when those direct questions come back. You know, so you're saying without Jesus, I'm going to hell. But what is to be gained in avoiding those questions? Really? Uh, does God love the world? Yes, more than you do. But the unqualified statement, God loves you, well, it's only half the gospel, isn't it? And it will not bring people to find forgiveness in Christ, to seek repentance. See, brothers and sisters, are we willing to be honest? with people about their sin and their future. I'm not saying in every conversation, but at some point, right? Jonah reminds us that obedience is hard, that it's often uncomfortable. But, and this is very important, this is where this narrative is taking us, it isn't pointless. It isn't pointless. For God's word always does its work. God's word always does its work. Listen to verse 5. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. Now just take that in, right? The whole city responds from the greatest to the least. And their response is change, is repentance. That's what the sackcloth is a picture of. You see, God's word always does its work, even from a fishy-smelling, grumpy man from a foreign land. Right? And you think you're unqualified. And it is God's word that affects this change in them, uh, for they heard Jonah's voice, right? He was the one bringing the message. But what does it say? Verse 5, the people believed God. It's God whom they believed. Now, 
In many ways, the account could have then jumped straight to chapter, verse 10, right? Nineveh repents, God relents, but it doesn't. Why? Again, because I think we're slow to believe this reality of how God works by his word. And so we're about to have the uh, tennis Australian Open again, right? Like the super slow-mo camera at the tennis, you know where they have the camera fixed on the, the, the service line and you get to see each muscle contraction a fire, you get to see the sinews tighten and the raw power of the service action. Well, the same thing kind of happens here. The account slows right down and zooms in to show the raw power of God through his word, changing even the hearts of a mighty pagan ruler. All right, listen to verse 6. It says, The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock taste anything, let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish it's incredible isn't it the king makes jonah's message national policy and again all of that without even a a meeting with jonah you see it's god's word that's doing its work uh, because it is a powerful and effective word it is the spirit's sword Powerful to affect mercy. Verse 10. When God saw what they did, how they turned from the evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. God's word changes a city. But just before we move on, I want to make a uh, quick comment about the historicity of Jonah. Uh, Because this apparent revival can sometimes be a a cause for doubt for some about its accuracy. Uh, But before I say that, let me just mention, I do believe Jonah was a real historical figure. I mean, 2 Kings 14 mentions him. Jesus seems to think of Jonah as a real person. That's enough for us. Um, Also, I don't have a problem with the miraculous events in Jonah. You know, the the fish, chapter 1, the Uh, fast-growing and withering tree that we'll discover next week in chapter 4. Because really, if we accept that God spoke this universe into being and raised Jesus from the dead, fish and trees are kind of a doddle, aren't they? I don't have a problem with the miraculous. Uh, But that doesn't mean the Bible gets a free pass. It means that we actually need to take extra care to see what it is saying and not claim something it's not saying. So what's actually happening here in Nineveh in Jonah chapter 3. Is it a whole city turning to worship Yahweh? Is it an outbreak of Jewish religion in Nineveh, which is less than a century before Assyria will go and conquer Israel? Is that what's happening here? I'm not quite sure that's actually what's happening here. Uh, And I'll tell you why. You see, unlike the pagan sailors in chapter 1, and Jonah himself in chapter 2, there's no mention of vows and sacrifices in the king's response. There's no hint of personal commitment to Yahweh here. Uh, And secondly, God is not spoken about using that covenant relational name, Yahweh. Uh, It's the word Lord in your Bibles in capitals. Uh, Unlike chapter 1 with the pagan sailors, and Jonah with chapter 2, right? He is used, used, he is spoken of using that name there. Uh, in other words, I'm not sure this was conversion, okay? Now, it certainly is change, quite dramatic change. This city turns from its particular evil, uh, but if there's no external evidence of Assyria suddenly becoming Jewish, I don't think that's actually surprising. Uh, although I do reckon we'll probably meet some Ninevites in glory 
because of Jonah's preaching. But hang on, maybe you're thinking, doesn't that somehow discredit God if we're not talking about conversion, salvation here? Does it make his actions less merciful or wonderful? No, I don't think so. Because again, here we see God caring enough about his world to actually step in and graciously halt evil, whatever it was that they were up to. Uh, and that's actually what he, would, he said he would do. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 18. Uh, and if that nation, this is talking about foreign nations uh, that the prophets had prophesied against, concerning which I have spoken, turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I intended to do it. You see, God's word always brings about God's purposes. Always. And actually, by sparing Nineveh, this generation of Nineveh, uh, this nation is actually then prepared as a tool of God's judgment for his people in the centuries that will follow. You see, it, it might be a different outcome than we were imagining, but God's word is still doing its work, isn't it? God is in control, changing lives, transforming communities and altering world history. That's what God's word does, and this is another example of him doing it. And so as we finish today, I want us to ask, well, how can we encounter God's word as it really is? God's power to change lives, mine and others. Because I reckon there's sometimes, it feels like there's a bit of a disconnect there, doesn't it? A disconnect between what we're saying about God's word and what we experience in our life. Well, thinking about God's power to change others by his word, firstly, today I want to encourage us to have a bigger perspective. A bigger perspective. Let me explain what I mean. Uh, it's possible, stick with me here, it's possible to believe that vaccines are dangerous and cause autism, right? It's possible to believe that, looking through your own small unreliable anecdotal experience that confirm your beliefs it's possible to believe those things but it's wrong isn't it and it's foolish to believe those things about vaccines because the bigger picture shows us otherwise vaccines work they save lives it's the same when it comes to sharing god's word with others now, your experience may tell you it doesn't work as in you tried once sharing it with your friend they didn't become a christian and so you go, well, maybe I won't bother. But that's all it is, friend. It's your experience, one account. And it doesn't change what God's gospel is. The power of God for the salvation of all who believe. Right? Like the, the vaccine skeptics, we need to challenge our perspective. We need to look through the evidence uh, in God's word of God's work through his word to bring people to repentance and life because that's what it does. That's how God works. Uh, a friend of mine at college, he became a Christian at uni through walk-up evangelism. Yes, even through walk-up evangelism. As in a guy came and said to him, hey, can I talk to you about Jesus? He kind of reluctantly said, oh, yeah, I suppose. Uh, they agreed to meet up three times, meeting up, opening the Bible together. He was a Christian. And now he's actually a minister of the gospel in another church in Sydney. Uh, I also remember when I was at college hearing about one of the teams that went to Gladesville one mission week. Uh, they set up a table outside the church chatting to passers-by. Young guy walks past said, hey, can we tell you about Jesus? He said, oh, yeah, I suppose. Uh, they shared the gospel with him, you know, two ways to live in a minute. And he was like, you know what? I really want this. I want to become a Christian. It sounds outrageous to our ears because we don't hear these stories all the time, but it really happens, friends. Right? Sometimes in dramatic ways like this, sometimes in the mundane and slow ways. But every Christian in history is proof. Right? Every believer in this room is evidence, actually. We need to learn to see God's perspective, his bigger perspective, when it comes to his word, that he really does work through his word to save lives, then open our mouths and speak of Jesus, right? Because that's what he does. 
And when it comes to ourselves then, God's power to change you, let me just say a couple of things as well. Uh, Firstly, I want to encourage us to be honest. That is, is our lack of change because our time with God's word is token. That is, it's just a a job to do. It's a task to tick off in the morning. Uh, And little, uh, often this is too true of me, let me add. Well, let me encourage us to do one thing differently. One thing differently. That is, pray specifically about what you've just read. Turn that word to prayer immediately. You know, Father, help me to know that thing better that you've just revealed to me. Help me to take on that attitude. Uh, Please help me to put off that behaviour. And please remind me of this throughout the day, Father, by your spirit. Engage with God in his word, in prayer. That's the one thing I'd love us to do. But secondly, as we think about God's power to change us through his word, I want to encourage us to be patient. To be patient, because reading the Bible, it's a relational activity, isn't it? It's knowing God. Uh, Just as Knowing my wife has slowly changed me. Uh, Who would have thought I'd enjoy musicals as much as I seem to be lately? Uh, God's change of us through his word is real, but it's often slow. Because it's the work of someone with another someone, me. This change will take a lifetime. It will take hearing and failing and repenting and doing it all over again. But God's word is powerful and effective like nothing else. And so go back to it. Keep coming to him. Get to know him better. Because you see, friends, it's no coincidence, is it, that in John 1, Jesus is introduced as the word of God. Uh, John is joining the dots for us that the powerful figure who made us who called us, defeated sin and death for us, that's who we're encountering when we open the scriptures. Can Jesus change me? Can Jesus change others through me? Absolutely he can. He's made you a new creation, hasn't he? And so let's get to know him. Let's engage with his word, speak his word to ourselves and others that he might transform us, that he will transform us into the likeness of Christ. Amen. Thank you, Andy, for teaching us from Jonah 3 and reminding us of the power of God's word. I know it's an encouragement that I desperately needed to hear as well. Brothers and sisters, in in response to what we've heard, we're now going to hear another hymn. This hymn is called uh, God Whose Almighty Word. It's a hymn that will remind us of what we've heard a little bit of in Jonah chapter 3, is that God works through his word. He changes lives through his word, that his word is, is his power where he shows his greatest power apart from the death and resurrection of Christ. So as we hear this hymn, uh, reflect on what we've been listening to in Jonah chapter 3 and make parts of this hymn or even the whole hymn a prayer as well for yourself that you would uh, remember God's power in his word, that you would live a life changed by God's word. So let's listen to this hymn.
brothers and sisters, our service is coming to its conclusion. In a moment, Meryl's going to come up and uh, instruct us on how to leave the building in a COVID safe way. But before we leave, before Meryl dismisses us, let me pray for us in response to what we've heard, what God has taught us from his word today, that we would live lives that are changed. Let's pray. Kind God and Heavenly Father, thank you for teaching us through Jonah chapter 3 this morning. Help us, Father, to be people who speak your word, knowing that that is how you work today in your power. Father, when we fail to see lives changed by the gospel, and when our efforts seem to fall on deaf ears, help us to remember the bigger picture, that this is how you work, and that even us who believe a testimony that this is what you do, that it is your power. Kind Father, please help us to persevere when we, uh, when we face resistance, remembering that we speak the truth and we speak your words. And kind Father, please help us also to live our own lives changed by your word, to be more and more changed into the image of Christ day by day. Help us to do this and to persevere in this, engaging with your word throughout the rest of our lives. Amen. Please listen to Mary.